we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Ryan, Associate Professor at CSU, to come down to talk today. Elizabeth is an old colleague of mine from the CRSP, the CRISP at USAID from 2014. Uh, she's an Associate Professor in the Department of Environmental and Radiology Health Sciences in the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at Colorado State University, long mouthful, and Colorado School of Public Health. Her multi-platform research strategy covers molecular biology, laboratory animal models, companion animals and livestock, and human clinical trials. She has a portfolio of over 80 peer-reviewed journal publications with collaborations across the broader fields of agricultural, microbiology, immunology, oncology, pediatrics, and nutrition. She provides expertise globally on gut health properties of whole grains, legumes, and fermented foods. Her current research program has funding support for the National Institutes of Health, and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, on, and her Global Health Research Awards have been supported by the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We're very, very fortunate to have her come down. She's going to talk a little bit about how, perhaps, how some of her research interests might have some good, strong overlaps with what we do here in the climate and weather realm here at NCAR. So we're very fortunate to have you come down, Elizabeth. Thanks so much. And so we're talking about a One Health strategy for innovating food systems at the rural-urban interface under the impacts of climate variability and change. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here at NCAR and to learn more and to meet more of you because I think this last piece we added to my title because that's really where I'm interested in moving some of this work. And um, so whether I, I feel like I've gotten to the One Health strategy piece and innovating food systems has been this long-term theme since I've been at Colorado State over the last decade. Um, and this under the impacts of climate variability and change is just like a very strong area of interest, um, learning more and understanding more, but that's definitely a goal is to seek kind of more collaborations and, and opportunities with this work. As uh, Tom introduced though, nutrition, and I put this up here because it really encompasses the extremes that my laboratory has been working in, and an under to nutrition and over nutrition, both of those being malnutrition, um, we have a strong work in colon cancer. I'm not going to get too much time to talk about the work I do in Colorado, some of it, but we do clinical trials with different diets and foods specifically for colon cancer, so that's the gut health piece. But a lot of the immune and microbiota and food work that we're doing on this extreme of overnutrition and colon cancer risk is highly relevant to what we're finding and needs are in similar foods, similar immune responses. Um, and under nutrition just in different locations. And again, this rural-urban interface piece to this has been a really fascinating story because we are working in both rural and urban populations, whether here in Colorado or um, overseas. The common piece, though, is inflammation in the gut. Right? Everybody is known across the lifespan now we're seeing an increase in inflammation in the gut. Um, to various immune dysfunctions. Um, an area that I've been very interested in is this gut-brain access, so linking some of the microbiome and microbial understandings in the gut to our everyday lives and uh, functioning, and a lot of the distress and fatigue in the gut um, and how that's been impacting lives as well. And so the public health realm to this has been extremely relevant. So I bring up right away, though, foods, because I think before we can move forward, uh, legumes has been something as a big class of food crops that we've spent a lot of time in. Every culture and every food culture has some legume associated with it, right? These are the staple proteins that we've gone through. As we've been studying more and more, um, and again, driven largely from my understanding of the colon cancer work, there is a huge body of evidence out there for dry beans, just your basic common beans having protection, whether it be all these animal studies have been done and more human studies are being done. And so this is work that's been funded by um, NIH and some other groups. And now we're trying to find biomarkers of how we can track people that are consuming some of these foods. I also put cowpea on here because this is a um, staple pulse crop in West Africa and other parts of southern U.S. as well as in other um, parts of Africa that we've been learning more and more about because of a lot of its... Um, climate adapted properties, drought resistance, low water needs, um, and it having, again, unbelievable amount of support from a health standpoint regarding cardiovascular disease. And I'll show you um, as well a study that was completed in children in Malawi with a collaborator, um, Dr. Mark Maneri from Washington University. This has been recently published um, work, but basically given the data on common bean and cowpea that was coming up as staple proteins that need to have more study on them, but also for their fiber that they're providing, he followed and did a feeding trial comparing to a corn-soy blend. So corn 
and soybean and a combination of micronutrients supplemented for young children has been a staple, right? This has been a common feeding food that's been used. The question is, we'll switch it out with cowpea and common bean. Are there going to be differences in this growth faltering of these infants? And they did this all the way up to eight, uh, 12 months of age. We've also followed children to 18 months. And there has been improvements. And this is where cowpea really started to flag on my radar from a malnutrition standpoint in developing countries and where there may be some opportunity. There's been work also looking at gut microbiomes and other pop, um, properties. But I start with that data because it takes it to another level of saying, here's what we've used. We still have this continuous problem. Micronutrient supplementations haven't been working enough what staple foods do we have on the planet that can help um, bridge some of the stunting gaps? So if you were to summarize my program, it's really about pulling partnerships and research, doing training and education of um, students across a number of different disciplines. And I say sustainable foods for gut health because a lot of it has been focused on problems occurring in the gut and improving absorption and, and, and capacity. I study small molecules. I'm a molecular toxicologist by training. Um, I'm very interested in small molecules. I started out with them mostly being from pesticides, chemicals, drugs. Um, moved mo most of that work since coming to CSU to be from foods, realizing that you eat thousands and thousands of chemicals a day, and we don't think about phytochemicals or plant chemicals in the same way necessarily, um, but we've been able to start bridging that gap. And then um, another exciting thing is I've mostly worked in rodent models and doing human trials, but over the last decade we've been able to move some of the work on same foods, and I'll show you this today, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, but to pigs and to cattle and to um, dogs and cats and things like that too um, with working in the veterinary school. And most recently we even did weaning dairy calves. So, and, and horses as well. So it's been really, really exciting. So I'll, I'll talk about a theme of um, some foods, but the idea here has really been about what are our exposures? So the exposome is a term that's been brought out in the era of omics um, that covers all your environmental exposures, which food is a big part of. And integrating kind of what is happening in the body or in a host as with kind of our interactions with our environment. And complicated as it may be, the idea here is if, if you want to focus on child health, for example, this is a major uh, area in which we can understand risks for different diseases, understanding ways we can think about different multiple exposures at one time. So typically in settings where water quality is quite poor, we're not just focused on salmonella or E. coli. We're also thinking about a host suite of other pathogens or concern of our microbes. And then what, do, what really is the environmental burden of disease? And this is an example of where overlaying some climate work would be really, really uh, phenomenal to understand some of the persistence of chemicals in our environments, pathogens in our environments, changes in food supplies and dietary patterns. Um, so as we go through today, I'll probably give some examples of where I keep seeing really exciting work and where this climate piece could be um, an, an, an opportunity to engage. This uh, comes from one of our Areas I'm going to familiarize you with this term environmental enteropathy. So it's a gut dysfunction that doesn't, it's subclinical. Okay, this is not something where you can just diagnose a child and say they have enteric dysfunction and environmental enteropathy. It's, it, it is an abnormal small bowel actual phenomenon where you have impaired nutrient absorption, repeated, you know, risk of uh, dietary, diarrheal infections. Um, but the idea is none of us are sampling small intestine regularly, particularly not in children up into the age of five, right? So there's been biomarkers developed, but it's not thought, to, I mean, you, you'll read things about it just being microbial exposures or maybe just being some pesticides and water and toxicants, but it's this combination and the idea being that stunting is the outcome, okay, that we're seeing not enough growth. Um, transient versus fixed, I mean, there's different uh, layers to talk about this. My group decided um, to write another perspective article thinking about all these layers, because right now the exposome itself, and so here's an example of where we started working with uh, geographic information systems and something, I, again, I, I want to start leveraging more of here, where we're just saying, look, let's pick a few sites where we know there's predominant amount of stunting. Um, what are the pesticide stocks in some of these areas? Nobody ever even started linking increasing exposure to some of the chemicals. But then we also look at zinc deficiency. So how do we start overlaying this and understanding the burden in certain regions? Uh, food crops and food is and, and climate are all things that can go on here. The one piece I've put towards um, is thinking about, again, diarrheal pathogens because we're seeing this as one thing that's not 
Uh, we think we're addressing it. <laughs> Maybe oral rehydration salts, there's rotavirus vaccines, there's definitely initiatives in water hygiene and sanitation programs, and everything's doing some incremental amount of assistance to reduce it. But at the end of the day, we're seeing persistence of these common, wide known in all kinds of environments, in the food environment, in the home, in the water, um, in outdoor areas. So Salmonella and E. coli are kind of the classic we started with, but we've moved a lot of our work into addressing rotavirus and, and norovirus as well, now that um, rotavirus has a vaccination. So if you go back, I mean, into the literature a little bit much, it's, it's interesting to see how uh, we want to study these, right? Because you only want to study one typically at a time, and you want to pick a region, and you want to pick a disease condition and maybe the way they've been studied. And so there's no shortage of clinical trials addressing maybe one type of infection. But what we know is that it's coexisting. There's multiple infections, and, and you may look, you'll may you find what you'll be looking for, <laughs> um, but we have the capacity now to expand this. And so... I'm just showing you kind of broadly how diarrhea and respiratory, and this is specifically pneumonia, um, when you think about how it's spread across the globe from number of deaths, um, Africa and obviously Southeast Asia are areas in which we've been directing some of our attention to mitigate the problem. But it's also important not to just think about mortality because a lot of factors play in, but diarrheal episodes. So um, by the time, and, and this is coming from cohorts that I've worked with in Cambodia, that have said, you know, we don't know any different. I just grew up having diarrheal episodes. And if I have a week free of diarrhea, you know, it's not something that a lot of these young, this is a sampling of an 18 to 25 year old cohort now that are adults moving into health fields, moving into education fields, uh, coming from rural local villages saying, the number of episodes and counting isn't even always that significant, but it, this is where I believe we have an opportunity to understand in a prevention context and not always just look at the severe acute malnutrition, malnutrition that occurs after diarrheal episodes. Um, we've chosen to focus more on diarrhea and gut, but again, um, some of the air quality work and some of the interests in understanding climate impacts is really about the combination of these two being what uh, is, a, is a serious detriment to child health. So this idea, obviously, poor water quality and sanitation conditions. I mentioned vaccination strategies, oral rehydration salts. The adoption of oral rehydration salts has actually been quite poor. Micronutrient supplementation programs are out there. The outcomes from them have just been largely unsuccessful. So again, the idea here is food. It was just kept screaming whole food, right? I think we have many, many millions of dollars in efforts. Uh, one of the areas is why aren't we studying more whole food interventions in these places um, to address these concerns? We have this down. Uh, with the surgeons of microbiome research happening, um, here are some of the models thinking about not just, uh, you'll hear more and more about vaginal birth, C-sections, right? Having that early start to your microbiome and the gut for child health. Where perturbations, is there room to repair once these perturbations start to occur? What does it mean to have an immature microbiome that might impair growth and, and cause stunting uh, versus more of an age-appropriate microbial development? And this is really how we, st once this framework started to develop, the idea was, wow, we can do clinical trials and start looking at the mi gut microbiome changes as a metric, as something to monitor um, over time. And so one of the models with foods has been, in a classic nutrition sense, fat, protein, carbohydrates, fiber, right? We know how to look at micronutrients in foods. And the secondary metabolites is where I was wanting to put that lens, those thousands and thousands of additional chemicals, some of them having different bioactivities and functions, interactions with the gut microbiome, and this idea of controlling and preventing, not always treating disease is the, is the other piece here. Um, and that's where the environmental conditions at the time has been so important. Some of the villages that are working in, in these rural areas can tell you when diarrhea is the worst, right? I mean, it's just typically with these rainy seasons and monsoon seasons and as they extend or when the exposures in the children just to become more burdensome. Uh, you overlay that with maybe different layers of food insecurity, right? It's not all part of the year. It's certain times of the year that might have um, more food scarcity. So thinking about that temporal scale. But this, again, is the model that um, we've been taking and trying to say, where are the places with some of the highest burden um, from pneumonia and, and diarrheal deaths? And so I'm going to spend a little bit today, time today talking about a uh, place in West Africa, Mali. 
Um, and then again, where they have the Sahel region coming through and where there's been a lot of climate work being done, which we have yet to integrate to the level, but I think that um, I'm really, there's an opportunity now as, as we look into a, a one food system innovation. So if you take that same map, um, and we wanted to think about rice. And rice, I put this up here, um, not just having Indian heritage and coming from South India, but it's also half of humanity eats this crop. We've spent a lot of time sequencing the genome with agricultural efforts. It's all been heavily yield focused. Um, and traits, things like aromatic traits, you know, there's definitely traits that are desirable for rice for around the world for different cultures and different types of rice. But we also wanted to explain that those are also the regions where diarrheal diseases are occurring and, and, and highly prevalent. So if you think about rice as a system of processing, right, so with your starting material, regardless where you are, you dehull, you remove the hulls. Um, the hulls are sometimes used for bedding purposes. I mean, typically, if you look at mills, they're just laying, the hulls are laying around. Um, I think there's a group in Texas, and I'll have to be careful about this one, but it's silica, there's definitely extracting things from it and using parts of it in some places. Uh, brown rice, everybody knows and has eaten. White rice, but the bran is what I'm going to focus a lot about today. It's um, many, many millions of metric tons are produced annually, as you can imagine. A large percentage of it is either used for animal feed or wasted. Okay, and uh, when I started doing this work, more and more is now being going to animal feed. Um, but when I did start, there was a lot that was being wasted. And even places where they were saying we'd pay to have it be moved. <laughs> okay, because storing it isn't ideal. And, and it almost just kind of being treated as dirt in, in some places. So when I went to the literature, though, I realized, and I, I bring back the colon cancer in peace, is because the animal studies that have been done actually showed a lot of protective effects of this food, uh, rice bran, for colon cancer. I couldn't find one study, though, that had fed it to people <laughs> and actually looked, even though there were 20-plus showing protection against colon cancer. So the first thing we did was just to start feeding it to people, and all I did was feed, and it's SRB because it's stabilized rice bran, and I'll get to that point in a minute. And wanting to understand, is there anything wrong? Like at the, before I was going to start thinking about developing this food, is there something when you fed it to people that might be um, a problem in their terms of their microbes in the gut? And if you notice, there's even some on here that people use as probiotics. And there's ones on here that are um, short-chain fatty acids. They do things that are all supportive of gut health. So we felt pretty good, and then we didn't want to just look at the bacteria, but we also wanted to look for my, uh, molecules of the rice bran in the stool of people after they ate it. So after 30 days of eating rice bran every day, or 30 grams of the rice bran, which is about, a, I guess, a half a cup about, not even much more than that, I could detect small molecules in the stool of people after they ate it, which is a good thing when you want to do studies because you want to actually be, have good markers of consumption. And nothing had been done at the time uh, to do this. So now we could start thinking about our hypotheses a little bit more, and specifically from an undernutrition standpoint, that, wow, there's a lot of bioactive compounds in rice bran. So the molecules are there. They're actually there in the gut. They pass digestion. They change into molecules that already have evidence for some activity. How can we understand their protection against gut pathogens? Because places where rice bran is building up on the planet are also the places where children are dying of diarrheal disease. And so if this could be tapped into as a possible solution. Now, the idea for the leap, everyone says, is it couldn't, how did it come about? Well, in South India, where I'm from, there are people utilizing the bran of the rice from an Ayurvedic standpoint and for protection against gut pathogens and diseases. And it wasn't until I started to see that that was a common knowledge and use of it um, and consumption of the brown rice soaked in water. And so, so there was some knowledge prior. It just hadn't really ever been tested in um, animal models before. So the idea was also not just that um, the rice bran phytochemical contents itself may influence immune response. We need to check varieties from around the world because maybe some varieties, and, and that's one thing I had learned in India, was that they knew certain varieties were a little bit better than others. And so it took moving to agriculture. So before we could go there, though, I wanted to feed it, again, to animals and check and see. And so we were able to increase native gut lactobacillus. These are native 
uh, to our guts or probiotics that you hear about, but we're not supplementing anything, that rice bran was able to sustain this, as well as a marker of um, immunity, IgA, which is very helpful in terms of nonspecific protection against a number of pathogens, something that we've been a very hard time to increase from a uh, vaccine standpoint. But we, when we saw that we could increase it, we immediately started challenging with pathogens. And that's where we found out, wow, rice bran at this 10% of the diet, which in adults can be 30 grams a day, it doesn't have to be very much, um, has shown protection against salmonella. And I'm not going to go into all of the animal work because I want to move into some of the other things we're doing. But I do want to set the stage that, as I said before, we've been able to do this in preclinical models, which is neonatal pigs. You're not allowed to move into infants and children until you've shown safety and efficacy in a neonatal pig, which is the closest to the human. Um, and then we also did work in chickens. And as I mentioned before, we've been working in dairy cattle and um, and horses now too, because again, pathogens are not specific to a type of host. They're gonna be everywhere and they're in all kinds of systems in the environment. And there is an really an emerging body of literature looking at number of climate variables and uh, pathogen persistence in the environment. So again, could we link that with this solution? So it's not just that it works, but there's amino acids, and you're not meant to totally understand this. It's really just all the different small molecules that we think are having a role in this pathogen protection. This comes from the lactobacillus metabolism of rice bran. So methionine sulfones produced in a very large amount. Um, and this is one that's been implicated in this. I'm just bringing this up as there's classes of compounds from rice bran. There's also certain lipids that are decreased, some long chain fatty acids that are increased. So it's not just that rice bran contains one or two things. It actually contains, we're getting to the list of 25 to 50 things. We've identified up to 500 small molecules now in rice bran um, and trying to pinpoint what are the combinations of these molecules and how are they having this effect on pathogens. I'm just going to break down some of these. So you've got what we call a probiotic and a prebiotic, and a symbiotic is the terminology we use. So rice bran being the source of these prebiotics, the probiotics in the gut already. Um, and as you can see, it's producing molecules that have already been shown to be bacteriostatic, that have already shown to inhibit fatty acid th synthesis in uh, pathogens. Um, we've Antimicrobial resistance, I'll touch upon this a little bit at the end, but it is becoming a major problem in our pathogens to date, right? Antimicrobial resistance is thought by 2050, if you look it up next, to be more, gonna be killing more people than chronic illnesses, okay? And that's gonna be an interesting shift when we start moving back to infectious diseases being more, um, having increasing prevalence from a mortality standpoint over some of the chronic illnesses devastating us today. So the idea here is these symbiotics have a lot of application and a promise for protection against these persistent pathogens that are um, influenced by climate all over the planet. So as I mentioned before, linking back to agriculture, and this has been the mindset that I've had to do and, and why I'm doing it almost in my talks lately is you go back and think, okay, rice bran has all this promising opportunity, and then I'll go back and find out to get sources of it, and then I'll have a rice geneticist say to me, well, okay, which of the you know, 20 to 100,000 varieties are you going to work on? <laughs> and so, <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I'm not really sure about that one, but if just to give you a picture of some examples of the variety that exists, whether it's the size of the grain, the color of the bran, right? The um, various types of hulls that are on. There's so much genetic diversity within rice itself. And so I just put this up here because it's nice to think about it as one crop, but we want to appreciate that this is really highly varied and um, we've been testing different varieties. And this brings in just a bigger big, a part of the picture of where we want to um, again, apply a, a climate lens and we think about not just rice itself, but also bringing back legume crops so that they're not consumed at a ratio anymore, of, right, right? The ratio, if you think about a plate of rice with little bits of legumes, it used to be that it was more one to two and equal with legume crops. And we want to bring that back as well. Um, but legume crops also use feed and fodder. Mm -hmm. So I had a question on the previous slide. Yeah, sure. You had uh, white rice, brown rice, uh, bran, patty. I mean, how much benefit do we have get from everything you've talked about yep. from just to brown rice. So this is the bran, and this is a great question, I'll get to it more, but it's the 10% of the grain, roughly. 10%. Okay, is the bran. So the volumes, right, so if you want to talk about 50 kilograms yielding five 
right? Uh, five kilograms, so 50 kilograms of brown. And this is a conversion. It's not exactly the same for all the varieties, but it's roughly about the same. So the, you know, the production of this can be up to 50 million metric tons annually if you want to think about yeah, of just the brand, even for the volumes produced for half of, of, of the planet. Does that help give a little bit of perspective yeah, I, there? I, I, at least, uh, I know in my family, brown rice and white rice is the big question at dinner yeah. time. So if you can do this, by all means, great. It's not produced around the world because it goes rancid. Oh. And I'm going to get to this. So I showed you some amino acids in the brand. I've shown you the lipids in the brand are what make this go rancid. And how the processing has been to this can sit for years. Okay, that's why Fei Chan eats white rice and... In all your brown rice packaging, if you really want to go out into this, have you noticed it's smaller, right? You're going to have smaller packaging for your brown rice. So, yes, you should choose the brown if you'd like, but and to get it, and you'll get there. But for what I've been feeding people, I'm not going to feed you six cups of brown rice a day. So you're gonna, you want to go to the brand? Well, the brand's going to be produced and processed anyway, and, we, and that's what's being wasted here. The volumes that we're talking about that are staying brown, small, compared to the planet's production of rice. Okay. That, yes, this is really important to get that kind of scale in mind here um, to what we're talking about. Elizabeth, also, just mm -hmm. say Please. Slide, if I could. So yeah. The polish, you're just highlighting the different ways of removing the, the brown to the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the brand. The mechanical processing. processing. Very, very different, different locations. Yes. So not necessarily the same machines do. So there are a lot of different instruments, as you can imagine, that do this processing. They can go right from hot. You can do this serially right away in one, one site. There's two different machines. Typically, um, you know, they're buildings of <laughs> rice processing and cooperatives and uh, various scales of it. How some people actually do utilize... Um, parboiling, right? If there's water available in regions, they can parboil, and that means you're actually almost half cooking this. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is some of the bran stays into the white grain, and then you can polish it off, and that's one way of heat stabilizing it. Um, so there, if you read, there's different types of rice that you can get. Um, but for the majority, this is what's happening around the world, and this is what we want to tap into. And we want to stay, and so there's fats in this bran, and it will go rancid, okay, within about six hours. The fat range and percentage is about 6 to 21%, depending on the variety. There are places that take this right away and extract the oil. And now you're left with defatted bran. So we can, we'll get into processing a little bit um, as I move forward. But there are streams of things that are being done. Yeah. So quick question. I mean, Please. So uh, the original rice species has come from Japan and India, right? So everything else is your descendant, right? Um... That's a, I mean, I'd have to talk to a germplasm person, but there are wild rices originated from Africa as well, too. And there are rices, I mean, the cultivated, and the China, there's Chinese varieties that I would say are quite old, That's too. From India, I mean, from China, India and, sure, yeah. and Japan, okay. Hybrid. Yeah. Well, and so hybrid is another whole. Oh yeah. Yeah. So so that's a whole another category. I'm talking about pretty much the existing germplasm and traditional breeding that's occurring. I'm not working necessarily with varieties that are, um, many of these have been crossed and analyzed and, and we've done different things there. Um, but yes, there are some stronger origins and then being adapted to different places. No, these are great questions. So, I mean, I bring this back here mostly because there's all these streams, but I, I put this as my blue circle of just that climate lens again on all aspects of this system uh, is really uh, important if the brand is something we want to develop, and as rice still maintains uh, part of the, the entire system, it's, it's a framework that I've been trying to uh, utilize um, as we move forward. And again, I, I, it's not just about, and I put the picture of a grain there, um, it's not really just about rice on its own. I am also thinking about with legume systems here too. So now that we've kind of got our hands around what rice brand and what we're working in, I, I want to bring in... Um, another layer of fungal, tox uh, fungal exposures, because mycotoxins is also another factor contributing to child health and stunting. Um, I'm not going to go into the mechanisms so much, just that there are many different types of mycotoxins okay, coming from um, different fungal species. The first question I was asked pretty much when we started getting into this is this assumption that rice brands kind of cheap fiber, rancid fats, 
probably ridden with mycotoxins. Okay, so this is the um, approach. So you can imagine it's really hard to talk about something that's worked so well in animals <laughs> and to show you really exciting results of protecting the gut, inhibiting colon cancer, protecting against pathogens, mounting these nice immune responses that we haven't been able to do with other foods um, and something that's wasted. But then you realize the reality of what it's, what it's being faced with. And, mm-hmm. so can you, for us, environmental science, yes. science, can you define mycotoxin for us? Yes. So it is a small molecule produced by fungal fungi, okay, like aspergillus, penicillin, right? So these are the compound, these are the actual species that are responsible for them. Corn and peanuts are going to be your main crops where we've really looked at uh, mycotoxins grown or fungal pathogens grown on them and the levels have been off the, you know, far exceeding toxicity levels. The, one of the areas that um, I started getting into mycotoxins was like, for example, liver cancer, interactions with hepatitis and mycotoxin exposure. Again, not thinking about them on their own, but how do they get influenced when they're starting to come in with a zinc deficiency and mycotoxin exposure, right? Or um, heavy burden of diarrhea and now these small molecules as you're starting to grow. So I think alone they've been studied, but it's really about when they start linking with other viruses and pathogens and other compromising conditions that you start to really see their effects. So again, I'm just putting out another thing out there that if you wanted to put up mycotoxin in in foods and climate change and climate science, there are definitely uh, linkages out there talking about persistence and expansion to other crops where it may not be a problem. So for example, as peanuts are being transported that are exposed with other food types, there's room. The other area you'll start to see is in feed for livestock, right, Um, where it's become another concern, and then how much of it is actually in the food animal products. So I started out talking a little bit about the microbiome. I was, I I really, I go back to this paper quite a bit because um, it touches upon crops, it talks about forecasting, it talks about really the microbiome and the earth, you know, and this is the Earth Microbiome Project, actually came a lot about here in Boulder um, at, at UC. And there's just uh, a number of parameters when we think about soil and we think about temperatures and we think about demand um, for water and we think about crops itself. But again, integrating some of what we know on health in human populations and particularly child health into these projections, I think, could be really important, especially when we're thinking about diarrhea and pathogens and those being part of the microbiome. Because as the microbes on the planet are changing, they're fostering I mean, these pathogens are smart, right? (laughs) They're creating little niches and places and and even stopping maybe their replication during certain temporal aspects of the year and then trying to increase when when it's favorable. But maintaining their ability to live in certain environments is really, really important. And so um, this paper went on to really think about microbes at different Uh, moisture conditions, temperature conditions, humidity conditions, and maybe we see a fluctuation in terms of uh, maybe pathogens, diarrheal pathogens are a problem for a while, and then maybe we shift and it's the mycotoxins that are going to be an issue for a particular crop, or um, maybe we need to be harvesting rice during times when things don't grow, right? Or, or how do we figure this out in a way that might be most protective? Um, this was coming from another recent paper um, trying to layer not what they were, you know, they're writing the biosphere down here, but putting our food system, and then when I, when I saw the undernourished and overweight at the top, I thought, oh, wait, I rarely ever get to see. It's usually I'm studying, you know, we're studying this in a global health context of child malnutrition, and then we're studying kind of overweight and obesity. But the reality is in many of these places now, we're seeing both, right? And both are a problem, and both need a solution at the food system level. Um, this is doing a projection of kind of from, I think it's the 60s, I don't want to spend too much time on the paper, to today. And thinking about some of these, um, you know, the volume of food now being actually much higher than it was in 1960, and we're still receiving this similar problems, but we're also not working across these areas enough. So that being said, and I'm just going to move a little bit quicker here, I think I wanted to pull out um, this idea that mycotoxigenic fungi do pose a huge risk. They're, never, they're not going away anytime soon. We need to make sure some of our predictions include them into um, a very aggressive production. 
food systems and nutrition and um, changes in climate. So not just water availability and scarcity, but the quality is really what I want to get at. What are the compounds in these foods? It's not just zinc and iron and calcium and phosphorus and, you know, just the classic micronutrients. There are small molecules that I think we can uh, better understand. Um, and ultimately, what are the health implications of some of this? Um, how do we get to this uh, persistence of these chemicals in, in, as well as another piece? So from a rice brand perspective, um, as I mentioned to you, I did start going around. We, we did receive funding to be able to collect field rice bran because it's easy to work with a breeder and get grown in fields and rows and how many different, I mean, that's not the real situation is going to the mill and collecting the bran. And what we've done here is a metabolomics analysis where I'm looking at all 500 molecules at the same time without much bias and seeing how similar or different all of them are. This is RBT 300 comes from California mill where it's been heat stabilized in a very nice controlled setting. Uh, we use it for our feeding studies, very, very clean molecule. You can see it's separating out, <laughs> um, which I would have liked to see it come closer because we've done a lot of work with this. Um, LTH and SHZ are two very different Chinese varieties that we've received. We, IAC 600 is this one from Brazil. Um, that actually has a purple, purple brand. We've seen unbelievable protection with it against certain pathogens. So the idea is Nevada is the one um, over here. Sorry, I have a stick that I promised I'd use. Is a medicinal variety from India that I said only grown for medicinal purposes. Um, where Chenulas, it's like mostly uh, closest cultivated variety. So right now, it's as we understand more and more about what's in this, linking with breeders, the, right now to date, nobody breeds for the brand. I guarantee, I, I, I have yet to find, and I think I'll be the one to be contacted if someone does one day. I would love that. I think there's a huge opportunity for that. There's a number of climate factors being included into breeding initiatives, uh, but for the purpose of the brand itself, there's not anything to date. Um, so I'd like to summarize in the sense of the brand, you know, it's not just removing it as an animal feed. I think we can optimize it as animal feed, but how do we consider it human food? Those are pictures, one from Mali and the other one's from Nicaragua, just to give you an example of how it's currently uh, collected, <laughs> right, on the ground or pretty much. Um, this idea is that we, and I'll talk a little bit about the trials that we've been doing with rice bran, because as you can imagine, the local name for it is quite... Um, it's considered dirt, it's pig feed, right? And it's not something you want to feed your babies necessarily that are now your pride and precious <laughs> forever. Um, so this is, there's been a lot of cultural, social dimensions here. No matter how strong the research has been, and, and I know climate scientists can, can relate to that, <laughs> right? No matter how strong it is and, and how much a pos potential opportunity there could be, um, there's been a lot of resistance to move forward. And so we were fortunate to finally be able to move into young children with this product or, or with a product, but we had to use a U.S. product. It was not to use the local ones because, as you can see, there's a number of things that we need to figure out still. Um, but we took six-month healthy infants. We didn't start with children that were at risk. They were at risk for malnutrition, but they were healthy to date, to that six-month date. And we just slowly increased rice bran per day, and we did not intervene in a control group. Uh, there was no control at the time that was thought to be equal to do. Um, and just to give you an idea, we chose a place in Latin America, in Nicaragua, that we knew produced rice bran, where I had folks on the ground to develop infrastructure, and we chose a site in Mali, same thing, where we needed the teams that could follow babies for six months during this time period, and community health workers is how we delivered the intervention. So lots of different um, orchestration of efforts, captured information on diarrheal disease, Nicaragua had just launched the rotavirus uh, diarrhea pro protection program, so they had, a, and they just happened to have that year a low diarrhea year. So that combination of these factors, um, but we did see protection in the in the Mali cohort. I'll just go uh, forward with that, just to give you an idea of the amount of information that we collect on every single household when you are involved in a clinical trial like this. You know, what their sanitation systems, the type of um, water sources. Um, mother's education, breastfeeding status, and some of the weight information, and household animals being a key, key piece here because, again, they are coexisting in their environments with a whole suite of different exposures. And the timing of the year and the patterns that year we've already shown to be impacting how our trials um, um, work out. So, um, as I mentioned, there were fewer episodes in our rice bran group when you compare it to our control group in the Mali cohort only. Um, and 
Later, we went further to um, take a look at growth outcomes in both cohorts. And to be honest, we weren't really even focused on growth for this particular, for this primary study, but we did see statistical increase in length for age. And this was just um, pretty amazing to see that in six months we could take one food. Um, the trial, as I showed you, and initially with cow pee, and were done in hundreds of children to get that type of um, outcome. And this was only done in 50 children in each site. So I'm not going to spend too much time here except to say that we did do water sampling at our sites in every household. This is a rapid E. coli test, so we can collect water from the households. And um, we had local folks on the ground doing an overnight assessment, and the color change tells you if it's ridden with E. coli and if it's safe or not safe. Um, we... The community, after doing this, actually came back and said, can you tell us what time, what t can you do this throughout the year, or can you do this over different years? You know, there's a lot of opportunity to think about some actual on-the-ground measures over even a decade of time and training local folks to get involved. And so this is something I'm very interested in, because sometimes of the year it might be fine to be storing your water like this, and other times it may not be. Um, and how that's changing over time is, is something they're interested in. To give you a little bit of idea of the other aspects of the food system, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that chickens will be walking all over rice as it's drying, right? I mean, very common practice, but it's also something if we're thinking about utilizing the bran fresh that we need to take into consideration um, from a food safety perspective. Um, and, you know, where is it going to be stored in some of these places? How is it going to operate at the mill? Is it going to be with different types of containers? How much use and, and care are we going to take? Sometimes it's being fed with fish. Sometimes it's being fed with other products. And so right now we're at a stage where we need to prototype and develop out a processing system in which rice can be um, captured. And we're looking at different opportunities. Right now, solar in this one village, they identified it in a readiness kind of model where we asked them, how would you like to heat it and stabilize it and use it? And solar came out. We've thought about different drum systems for collecting it, and ultimately the food safety testing and then how we're going to deploy that as a, as a product. Um, in Mali right now, there's uh, four varieties that they've identified that they plant regularly that they think could work. So we went and collected them and um, have done analysis on them. We've been thinking a little bit about the location right now. It, the political situation in Mali is very difficult, and it's hard to get around, but I think that they have a huge opportunity with the right infrastructure and, and locally. I'm uh, taking a sabbatical starting in August and taking some time next fall because in January is when they'll have their next big lot of rice bran uh, potentially available, and we could work out the stream um, through the years. So that's, that's where we are. But again, I do know there's a number of environmental factors that we should be taking into consideration now or that might that exist already that we could um, take into account. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much more detail about the distribution scheme. But I do want to bring up this concept of dry chain. And it goes to some discussions we were having a little bit earlier at lunch about decision making and the process of decision making at a post-harvest uh, setting and understanding what, again, are these environmental conditions? Is there such thing as even doing moisture packaging or are we talking about rapid use of something or creating a stream that goes into it? And, um, and, and so the idea is food waste being another uh, area that we can reduce by taking uh, more into consideration. I'm gonna wrap up by just explaining that this link again between disease and malnutrition, we wanna be in a health space. We know we can do it. Um, we know that there's opportunity. It's not just infectious disease. We're also thinking about protection against chronic diseases. Um, but this has been the model that my group's been working under. Uh, where we can put in environmental concerns of climate, I think from the diarrheal and pathogen exposure, that's definitely there. And finally, um, we've already shown that we want to go across, as I said, water. We've got the energy piece on the processing. We've got the health. We're using dried blood spots, so it's really low invasive ways of measuring um, impact. We're trying to cover all different types of foods. It's not really just about whole grains and legumes. Those are the ones of the system that we're trying to put in there. Um, but these are our metrics. Like I said, there's room right now to really understand um, how we can uh, move forward with um, the environment. I'm going to finalize. I have a few more minutes still. We're doing okay, right? Um, it's about, I've got, I'm just, yeah. the, 
the last piece of the water that I want to bring in because what we found when we sampled the water is our rice fern group actually had a higher burden of pathogen-ridden water than our control group, even though we were able to protect so or show protection. And so differences there has been something um, where I've found a lot of information about even just rainfall patterns that year being an indicate because their water is coming uh, from different sources. Much of it, the river, is what we found after actually sampling these areas. Um, and maybe there are times of the year where that's okay. But the pathogens in the water themselves, we're finding, have resistance. And so bacterial resistance or antimicrobial resistance, may, many of you may have heard extended spectrum beta-lactamase. This is the most common Carbapenem resistance is actually a really serious concern and threat. This is our last resort antibiotics. So um, we don't, we want to have an understanding of how prevalent these are in the water systems right now. So we did receive some funding to take a look at a One Health approach and understanding bacterial resistance, not infection. So I just want to clarify, we go back here and we think these are threats because if you get an infection that has this resistance, it's hard to treat it, okay? But what, what our project was is to just understand the prevalence of these resistance in the environment, not necessarily in a sick or disease condition. So what we did, and this was done here in Colorado, in northern Colorado in Fort Collins, we went and sampled from rivers, from the wastewater treatment, from livestock, from companion animals, from humans, right? Different sources, and this is the One Health approach. And we literally cultured out a number of different types, not just from, in fact, these are all healthy individuals and systems, um, a number of different types of bacteria that harbor antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance. And so the next step here, and you can find the paper, it's just put out. We had our sampling locations out there, and it's not just a handful of drugs. If you want to take a look at sewer water, um, wastewater treatment areas, we looked at E. coli, surface water, ambient water, which is effluent, and this from rivers, and we screened against a number of different drugs. This is where the diarrhea, it's not just about going and taking antibiotics and we're going to be better, right? That's definitely not the solution in many of these poor settings where antibiotics are widely available. Um, are there food solutions that we can go? Can we understand the amount of resistance that's existing even in a healthy environment um, and how this is changing over time? So I've spent a lot of time kind of talking about this human system here, the environment, but putting on here climate and um, antimicrobial resistance is really the future because we do know that this is a threat that's on the rise. And um, if there's some opportunities that we can mitigate that, even better, right? So the symbiotics that I told you about are ways we think we can mitigate this a little bit, as well as um, the rice bran seems to have some promise. So obviously, um, the partnerships are, as I mentioned, heavy in the agriculture and plant science sector microbiology and immunology. I come bringing the environmental health perspectives. We have a program at CSU called Global Social Sustainable Enterprise. I've engaged little teams in there for different countries it's because every country is going to be maybe a little bit different in how they decide to build this out. Um, obviously, public health nutrition folk, students and food system students have been extremely helpful, and the School of Global Environment and Sustainability has brought this together. Uh, funding sources and some folks from my lab um, Usman and Valerie are two from France and from Mali that I'll be working with into the fall. Uh, Nora, who just graduated, and Hannah and Shay there have been working on the symbiotics that I shared. Um, but really, it's about training some of these folks to, to do things uh, outside of their traditional you know, discipline comfort zones. And so then I've just highlighted some uh, funding sources to be able to work on all these things simultaneously <laughs> and in serial um, ways, too. So thanks so much for your time, and I'm happy to answer questions or clarifications. All right, thanks. Fascinating talk. Any questions? Mm -hmm. um, so I, in Asia, a lot of people doing yeah. breeding rice breeding, yeah. and, uh, <clears throat> try to plant the rice in a higher density because of the climate change or water supply shortage and so on. Mm -hmm. But by so doing, they can maintain probably a stable yield but uh, will that have some impact on the new nutrients of mm -hmm. rice? I mean, so Definitely, there's been people that have showed as the that that the nutrients are changing subtly in the rice itself. But we have to remember that um, it's the bran that actually has most of the nutrient value. The white grain itself is largely starch and carbohydrates. 
So it's something we would love to be able to monitor. There are some reports showing that there's variability in some of the micronutrient levels of the grain, but it's not always clear what they're talking about. Are they talking about the brown rice, the white rice, the bran itself? And, and so this work really is building that awareness that whenever that's being done, we need to be looking at these parts. Mm -hmm. But they're not being captured, so then the interest is, you know, they look at yield and then that's it, right? Yeah. There's no after processing. Mm -hmm. We need to... Um, you know, develop that interest to keep this further. It's there's a lot being wasted, or not not there's la, there's a lot where there's gaps in knowledge. Yeah. Is there a difference in the value of the rice brand from different varieties of rice? Right now, I couldn't see that anywhere. Like for example, in Mali, it was about a hundred kilos of bran, regardless, because the mills just mix it all. They're just packaging it all because it it doesn't matter. Um, it was ten dollars was the last time we had asked how much. So it's a lot. That's, a, that's very cheap. I mean, that's very, that was the only place. That originally, it was free, essentially free. There are places in Asia where they're willing to, yeah, essentially give away the defatted bran when they take the oil out of it. Okay. But animal feed, it goes, that, that's a lower value, right, because the fats are removed. Okay. Do you see? So it depends on the actual weight of the bran. But to my knowledge, there hasn't been any cost difference on variety for bran, Yes, for the grain, depending on the variety. Does that make sense? Is that oil? What's the oil used for? So the rice bran oil is actually um, being widely used over all over Asia right now in replacing of palm oil. Oh, good. And the health benefits, yeah, and the health benefits for the rice bran oil are actually a lot. There, there's tons of data on the oil itself. My biggest issue with us just promoting that is obviously there's it's a hexane type of extraction, which is now creating more solvent concerns. And um, the rice bran, you know, when you test defatted alone, it doesn't have the fat. The whole point is delivering some of those rice bran fats to the gut and making them accessible. And so by just doing the oil, you're not getting the fibers that are going to help you get it to there, too. So I really don't believe that in this day and age we need that step everywhere, <laughs> and particularly developing that step. Could be but the environmental problem. damage that's caused by palm oil production is mm -hmm. unbelievable. Right. Yeah, so the shift from that so is... So the shift would be... Yeah, it's actually happening, and it's better. the cost is not so high as either mm -hmm. because right, it's in areas where rice is. You can buy rice bran oil. It's more expensive here if you think about it. But, and no, nobody pays attention to what varieties went into the rice bran oil. I kind of joke with the olive folks. If only you guys can have a shop where every variety of olive oil is the product. <laughs> you know? I said one day for rice bran, that could be the case. And there's many more varieties than there are for olive. But is, would you say that, or do you know if the rice bran oil is actually, has a higher nutritional value than palm oil? Palm so, oil is just Right, so yes, the, the number of the fats actually in the rice bran oil we've characterized very well. Gamma arisenol is an example of a phytosterol and ferulic acid compound that's only in rice, it's not in any other cereal grain. And it has a lot of immune oh, properties that are just phenomenal. So, and the phytosterol is also cholesterol reducing properties of the rice bran oil. So, mm -hmm. yeah, its profile is quite good. So, I don't ever. Uh, want to speak poorly about rice bran oil, I just don't think that's the solution to making the oil of, from the rice bran. I don't, I, unless that's being put back in together. You know, it's that idea of we're separating them and then putting them back together. <laughs> um, but not everywhere can handle the production processes needed to make the oil. And that's a whole operation in and of itself. Can I ask a quick question about water Please. quality? Yes. And yeah, I'm not so familiar with the amount of irrigation in rice production that is going on or, mm -hmm. or afterwards in processing, what waters are being used. But one yeah. thing that is happening is aquifers are, are, are being depleted. Mm -hmm. um, there is pollution in streams and so on. And there's a la large increase in, in water that is being retained behind dams and so on that then can be used. But mm -hmm. this is water that has been exposed mm -hmm. and could accumulate all sorts of of pollution of, of many forms. Yeah. What is your thought if you know these trends continue, what that water quality component would be and how it, where it would go right. in and how, how far it would 
start to counteract some of the beneficial effects. Mm -hmm. I mean, the water, so the water used in the rice agriculture system, right? I mean, in, for example, in West Africa is all rain fed. That's directly right? rain fed. Yeah, and they've be built okay. a lot of canals for, you know, Wet being able rice. to. I'm sorry? Yeah. Wetland rice. Wetland rice, rice exactly. Rice and so the, Exactly. So the varieties that are being used. The, I think you're addressing something, though, more in terms of the agrochemical inputs being used yeah, yeah. in those systems is really outrageous <laughs> um, and needs control. One area I've seen in Asia that's been helpful to that is by co-growing with shrimp and fish and things in the patties has reduced the levels of inputs, but make, making sure they have varieties that grow in those areas. Mm -hmm. So bringing back that system has definitely brought awareness there how we think about long-term, you know, fresh water availability and things. Again, I think that's getting a little more outside of my expertise of having tracked any of that. Um, but the water quality is always going to be... But in the processing, I'm not aware. Oh, of in the processing. How much water needs to be brought in? We don't need water for processing. At all? There's none involved? It's electricity right now. It's okay. just that they there's these mobile mills that will move around sites as well as sites where everybody will bring their patty rice to the miller. And there is electricity at those places. So that's where the processing for the brand needs to be developed. Yeah. And in the U.S., we put it at the mill. I'm not, and maybe that's not the way it needs to be in other places. This is what the local places in the rural settings have to figure out. Because they're already traveling to process their rice. The question is, then whose brand is it? And, you know, do farmers ask for their white rice back and their brand back? <laughs> I don't you know, I mean, how do we have to do, think and try these different things? And if they can ask for their brand back, how quickly are they going to use it? Do they need to heat stabilize it? Maybe they just add it with their cooking and use it, you know. Uh, what are the in environmental conditions for moisture and, you know, packaging? Uh, I'm very concerned it's going to get contaminated with corn and peanuts and mycotoxins from other, if it's co-transported. Yeah. These are great questions, and I appreciate everybody being thinking at that system level. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth is here yeah. for another oh. couple hours. Um, mm -hmm. If anybody would like to have a chance to speak with her, and maybe mm -hmm. we'll get her down here again. Yeah, sounds good. Something. No, I definitely want to seek areas of more collaboration in this because uh, it's you know <laughs> it's a lot to do, and I think there is plenty of different dimensions it could go to. Thanks again yeah. for coming down. Okay, yeah, thanks. Do you have a question you want to ask after? Okay.